Buenas tardes, 18. Good evening. Today, October 18th, 2021, is the 60th anniversary of the publication of the first message of the apparitions in Garibanda. It's an anniversary that makes us think about our Blessed Mother's closeness, what she's done, what she's come to do, and look back on what she's done over these 60 years. If what she said has come true, her prophecies, the state of the Church, and history, we could talk about so many things that have taken place and how the Blessed Virgin loves us so much. Regarding the whole topic of Garibanda, some have loved her so much and some have hated her so much. It's a very interesting topic. To start, we're going to pray a Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, and our Mother, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Muy bien, pues soy el Padre José Luis Saavedra, algunos me conocéis, Padre José Luis Saavedra, la familia, los amigos, los que... Some of you know me, Father José Luis Saavedra. Algunos me habéis visto más veces. Some of you have seen me before. Hice el doctorado sobre las apariciones de Garibaldi. I did my doctorate on the apparitions of Garibaldi, a book that's over here. This book you can see here. Garibaldi, a la luz de la historia. Garibaldi, in the light of history. In 2017, I was thinking about this recently. I didn't attach too much importance to it before, but... But something beautiful is that it was the anniversary of the apparition, apparitions in Fatima, a hundred years. The Bishop of Fatima, in the following years, said that Garibandal is the continuation, a deepening of Fatima's message. Bishop Benancia, who took a picture with her when he visited Conchita in the States. So we said Garibandal has supporters and critics, people who love it a lot and people who hate it a lot. This book entitled The Apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary today, it's written by René Lorentin, who's a Mariologist, who devoted himself to the apparitions in Lourdes. A bishop asked him to do a conference on Lourdes, and he realized that there were no studies done on Lourdes, so he published 16 volumes about it. And from that moment, he felt called by the Virgin Mary to study apparitions. This book was published in 1990. Apparitions today. After discussing several apparitions, their messages and what they have in common, there's a chapter toward the end called controversial cases on the way to dissolution because of extinction or adequate treatment. And you know what the second one on his list is? Garibandal, 1990. Controversial cases. What does controversial mean? A controversial person is someone who's rebellious or a bother. But in Garibandal, the Virgin Mary shows that she loves the Church, defends love for the Pope, the Eucharist, our Blessed Mother. She raises hearts with so many conversions, physical cures and spiritual cures, vocations, pilgrimages, immense fruits. So thinking that that is like rebelliousness, does that make sense? The controversy is in a different area, at least in Garibandal's case. As Lorenten says, they will either go extinct or they will be dealt with adequately. So the solution is extinction or adequate treatment. It's interesting to see in the same book when René Lorenten comments that, that adequate treatment, he calls the Bishop of Santander and asks him, what is the Garibandal case like? At that moment, the Bishop was Puchol, 1967, a week before this Bishop passed away. 
He had taken statements of all the visionaries about their doubts, and he published that note on the Friday before Good Friday. It says the girls had made everything up as if it were a game. It was a child's game, and it has a natural explanation. And so Laurentin asks him, what is that natural explanation? Puchol's answer was, a letter he wrote in the final days of April, a week before he died, year 1967. A spontaneous retraction by the girls. In the first place, we have to say spontaneous, there was little spontaneousness. The Mariologist Felix Ochaita commented this. Very harsh things were done to the girls. They were demanded and treated very harshly. In this regard, I would like to mention the case of Sister Lucia of Fatima, a pathway under the gaze of Mary. In October 1917, when the miracle of the sun happened, the village was full of people. The people called us liars and asked us why we were deceiving that multitude. Lucia said truthfully and calmly that she hadn't called anyone to come. She was just minding her own business and people keep insisting harshly against Sister Lucia. So many people, page 98 in Spanish, so many people pushing them and asking them questions that in the end the, the shepherd children ended up saying yes to everything so that the people would leave them alone. It was very tough, especially for Lucia, who was considered the one responsible for the three, and because she was the one who spoke with Our Lady. They ended up saying yes to everything, so that people would leave them alone. So this is some of the pressure on the children in the operations. It's very tough. The shepherds at Fatima were pressured, and so were the girls in Garabanda. René Lorentin comments, Bishop Puchol passed away just two weeks after he published his note about the girls' retraction. So he didn't see, and besides it wasn't spontaneous, because it was under that pressure. On one occasion in Pamplona, the school confessor told Conchita if you don't deny the apparitions publicly, I'm not giving you the absolution. The governor threatened to boil the shepherd children of Fatima. They were going to go to heaven. But when the priest denies the absolution, that is a huge impact for a delicate soul who loves our Blessed Mother. Bishop Pucho said spontaneous retractions. So we've analyzed spontaneous, but retractions is a very delicate word too. Because regarding Garbanda, may God help me find this right now. I have to find this. But you're very patient. Blessed Bernardo de Hoyos says, I feel like the biggest liar of history. The visionary of the Sacred Heart of Jesus often spoke to his spiritual director that he was, quote, the biggest liar. He denied before everyone ever seeing the Sacred Heart and that everything he said, he made it up. Before, we quoted Sister Lucia and Parma. In mysticism's history, retractions made by the visionaries are frequent, unfortunately. And this is something Bishop Puchol was not aware of. On January 19, 1928, Sister Lucia, in Portuguese they say Lucia, wrote her spiritual director telling 
about her tribulation. I didn't know what to do. This is her quote. I was willing to go over the world saying to everyone that I had lied. The main visionary who talked to the Virgin Mary is talking about the apparitions of Fatima here. Was it a lie? Page 194 in Spanish. So, this happened to many saints. Saint Bernadette, Saint Gemma. I'm afraid to deceive myself and others in these extraordinary things that happen to me daily. Saint Teresa of Avila. I imagined that I had lied. Oh, I've suffered so much. Only in heaven I'll be able to say it. Saint Teresa of Lisieux, not Saint Teresa of Avila. This is story of a soul. Genial. Pues entonces vemos so we can see desde muy en los comienzos from the beginnings the apparitions at Garabandal suffered great contradictions because Bishop Puchol no lo no lo vio didn't see it clearly la when he published that note, the national press turned against the apparitions. Garabandal was everywhere, all over Europe. Rai, Radio Audizioni Italiane even came to record. They came with trucks to Garabandal to record the second message. There were so many publications, and the bishop publishing that note left things a little shaky. A bishop in Garabandal over the following years, Bishop Del Val, offered a 15-page report to several people, saying, when they asked him, he said, the only thing I have about Garabandal is this. This is the only thing that they've given me, is what I have here. 15 pages, one was missing, and on many of them, there were paragraphs missing. They were cut out. This is a copy, missing in the original copy, it says. There are some pretty harsh things here. It's like a summary of the toughest arguments. It were in the year 1973, if I'm not mistaken. What it says about the Milagruco, the Eucharistic miracle, is probably one of the most shocking comments. Well, first, there's an interesting comment about the girls that recognizes, quote, the investigating committee managed then to have the main visionary examined, Conchita, in Santander by a group of doctors and psychologists. This examine did not show any alteration, neither quantitative nor qualitative, of the visionary's personality nor was there any psychic influence in the apparitions." Unquote. But we get to the Milagruco, and there are often harsh comments about it. And so how do you explain the levitations? Quote, the miracle of the communion given by the angel. According to her own confession made by the visionary, Conchita, at the bishopric of Santander, she announced this miracle before. She herself performed it on July 18, 1962, unquote. They'd written letters to people they knew, especially priests and theologians, so that they could come and see the miracle that the angel had announced. Quote, it was at 2 a.m. Sorry, it's hard to read. Please be patient. I don't want to make a mistake here. Back in my room, I put a host on my tongue, and I came back out with my head turned upwards, and I knelt in a street to pray. Then I stuck my tongue out with the host I had put there before. 
unquote. According to this report, this is Conchita's denial that she made before the bishop, 1973, 1982, November 19th, the same visionary, Conchita, Glendale, New York, before a notary. On her behavior, undetermined events that took place in that village between the years 61 and 65. He wanted to write this because he heard that there was going to be a second investigating committee, like, in fact, there was, but later on. He discusses the miracle saying, it's going to sound like what I read earlier about Sister Lucia. As for the miracle, it seems to have been invented by me, as I have affirmed it in a statement. I can only say that I do not remember details of it during the denials. The only thing I do remember The only thing I do remember is that my desire to end the interrogations and avoid so many questions about something that I really could not explain. And I did not see or hear any rehearsal of the other visionaries. I didn't read it earlier, but in the other document, it said that the other girls also rehearsed it with her, but backed out for fear of the crowd. I did not see or hear any rehearsal of the other visionaries about the miracle of the communion, nor did I take part in them. It never occurred to me to do such rehearsals. The period of the denials is tough, shocking, tremendous. When I was studying in Rome, I received the grace to help the Pope on two occasions. Once I was an acolyte, on the other occasion I was deacon. When I served as a deacon, at the end of Mass, I greeted the Pope in 2012. I was with him just for a few seconds, or a minute, just to say thank you for his magisterium, for forming me as a seminarian through all his doctrine. He answered me in a few words, the conversation ended, and then I went back to my group of brothers, my community. A few of us were serving in that ceremony. Afterwards, I remember now, if everyone and all the priests told me that it wasn't true, and that it didn't happen, because in Garibandal, the pictures and videos, you can't see the Virgin Mary, but in, with me and the Hope, you can see the Pope. They would end up making me doubt. Well, if everyone tells me, I had it in my memory, but... Apart from this example, it happened to St. Gemma, St. Teresa, St. Therese, Bernardo de Hoyos, Sister Lucia. So spontaneous denials are not enough proof. I would like to share a quote with you all that I have here somewhere. De Lucio Rodrigo, sacerdote de la compañía. Lucio Rodrigo, a Jesuit priest. Bendito sea Dios y el Santo del día, porque tiene que estar. Por aquí, denme un segundo. Hang on a second. Bueno, esto es lo que tiene el directo, ¿verdad? ¿Qué más? This is what happens when we're live. Lucio Rodrigo. Lucio Rodrigo. These phenomena were not and could not be contrived by the girls. Nor could they be the result of imaginations of pathological origin. No one has any reason to destroy them or even to attenuate them simply because of what the girls may say at present or even in the future. They would be in an illusion, but we are not. Director espiritual 
Conchita's spiritual director. He knows her inside and out. He's familiar with the apparitions, he's been there, has seen them. He has no doubts. What the visionaries might say cannot change the facts. We've been talking about the girl's declarations in 67 and the ones she made before the notary in the year 82. If only it had to do with Conchita alone. So many people talked about the apparitions. During my thesis, I was overwhelmed when I saw there are thousands of first-hand witnesses. At some of the ecstasies, there were over 20,000 people present. I haven't had the chance to talk to many first-hand witnesses, about 300. Out of those 300 first-hand witnesses, do you know how many are not in favor? Three. Do you know how many are doubtful? Two. The rest are unanimous. With their variants, of course. Each person remembers certain things. That's how history works. Think about the narration of the Gospels. In his Gospel, St. Luke says in chapter 1, verse 1, Many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us. He's talking about Jesus. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. Know the facts. It's so important. The thesis of historical theology says, rely on the facts and know what really happened. So, three oppose, two are doubtful. The other 267, something like that. The fact is that the accounts are tremendous. This is a book by Roman Serrano, who appears in Garibandal, Unstoppable Waterfall. He's the director, environmental engineer in the region of Cantabria. He's written his memories. He witnessed the Milagruco. It would have been great if I had made a sheet with all the quotes I wanted to share. Quote. I held my flashlight. He's still alive. Pointing. Sorry. I was glued to her. After some time, she opened her mouth. At the moment of the Milagruco, when the girl falls to her knees, and there are thousands of people, this man is glued to her. She opened her mouth and showed her tongue, which was clean, immaculate. I was there with my flashlight, shining it on her mouth, practically putting it in the girl's mouth. Just imagine how close he was. All of a sudden, I was perplexed when I saw a white dot on her tongue that started to grow spirally until it became about the size of a peseta in diameter and two pesetas on top of each other in thickness. Now that we use euro, we don't know what those dimensions are, do we? We'll have to study numismatics. But this man was there. And I asked him, I was told that the girl had the host in her mouth. Who told you that? Others say that she had it in her hand, and in a movement, she confused everyone while she stuck her tongue out. Clean, as you said. Impossible. And it's not just him. All the Milagruco's first-hand witnesses say the same thing. It's impressive how in Unstoppable Waterfall, the documentary we released last year, 60 years after the apparitions, four people are first-hand witnesses in such a space where so few people fit. 60 years later, 
Why is letting time go by a problem? The witnesses die. We want to know the facts, and we can't. It's impossible. If the people who were there die, how are you going to know? Thanks be to God, some are doing this. But many have not. And you could think, well, study it. Okay. First, investigation commission. The main doctor was there once. Once. He tried to hypnotize the girls. He took them to Santander. I really would love to read you so many things that it's impossible. He took the girls to Santander. And the first day, this is Conchita's diary. She herself remembers the events and writes them shortly afterward. In 63. This is from August 1961. The next day, they took me with some doctors to see if I was sick. We went with a doctor whose last name was Morales and with several others. They all said the same thing, that I was fine and that all this about the apparitions was all a dream. They were going to leave me and sent in there to distract me so that I would forget about everything that happened to me and to not have any more apparitions. My mother was so convinced that she went home and left me there. Some nieces and a sister of Padre Odrio Zolas, the commission secretary, came to pick me up and go to the beach and to fairs. Things I had never seen until that moment. Since I went to the beach every day, the Virgin Mary did not appear to me. When her mother found out, she went to pick her daughter up right away, saying, What are you doing to my daughter? The girl did not want to return to Garbandal, but her mother took her and said, You're coming. When she arrives, she says a little further on, I went to confession. The world fascinates us all. When you're not familiar with it, it's attractive. The girls in Garabandal are not from outer space or angels. It's the battle we all have. We're all attracted by the world. Conchita said in 61, the beach in itself is not sinful, but for me it is. Now we're in 2021, so we'll have to see if we can still say that. The problem is vanity, superficiality, how badly we live so many things, how we want to put the flesh in God's place. And the Virgin Mary comes to warn us and to help us put things in order. God first, God first, and then God, then everything else. Do things in order. It just so happens that the first commandment is my health, my good name, my body, my vanity. What the Virgin Mary came to say was not so much a message for the year 61, but for today. Really. The first commission tried to hypnotize the girls. I didn't read it to you, but the other doctor in Santander tried to hypnotize the girl, which made her laugh. He said, look at this pencil, look at this pencil. And she started laughing, looking at the pencil, and he said, stop laughing, this is serious. I'm going to put an end to all of this. The first commission. Then came the declarations before Puchol in 66 and 67. And then one of the members of the first investigating commission was made bishop. As bishop, he started the second investigating commission, which took him 12 years. He made four failed attempts because of the hostility that existed toward the apparitions. It's finally formed under the charge of a university professor in Madrid, a religious priest, in Garabandal, unstoppable waterfall. Vildoso says his name. So this religious priest calls a student doing his doctorate on evolutionary psychology who's retired now, and said, study the case. You know I'll do whatever you need. But in matters of the faith, I don't know if I can help because I don't believe. 
It doesn't matter. You're going to do this for me. He studied the case, then called the priest saying, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's impossible. The priest called Bishop Delval saying, my reporter says that it can't be because he told me this, I've met him, he told me, the problem was that the people were so picturesque that you couldn't do anything logical there. Everything was just very, very disjointed and was impossible to get anything solid out of it. It would have been like analyzing crazy people. So, three months later, Bishop Delval, member of the First Commission, calls the priest in Madrid saying, don't send just one person, send a team. He named two anthropologists, two in each field. There were sociologists, like the first student the priest called. When they got there, the anthropologist was the only one on the commission who seemed to have a strong faith. Recently, I talked to another woman who was one of the anthropologists on the commission. This was another blessing from Divine Providence. I understood her. She is from Cantabria and tells us that when she began working on that commission, she saw that all they did was eat. There was a lot of movement, but that's it. The general secretary of the commission, the atheist, the priest from Madrid called, told me, we did not do anything. You're going to have an interview. Then everyone did their own thing. We changed methods, did some interviews, but very few. No one was serious. They took him to the bishop. The anthropologist resigned, saying, this isn't serious. The facts have not been studied. We've put on an act to say that there is a commission when really there has not been. I don't want to be a part of this. And that's the report that was sent to Rome. Ratzinger answered the second commission's report on November 28, 1992, and said, Felix Ochaita mentions it. Ochaita is a Mariologist of the Spanish Mariological Commission and theologian, theology professor at the Seminary of Siguenza. He says, the fact that the Bishop of Santander consulted Rome indicates that the matter is not closed. The Holy See has, says Ratzinger, carefully examined the documentation sent. This indicates that it is an important matter that has not been settled. Third, the Holy See does not consider it opportune to intervene. This assumes that it could do so. The Holy See leaves it to the diocese. Fourth, the Holy See suggests the bishop to reaffirm to make a declaration in which he affirms that the supernaturalness of the apparitions is not proven. As Ochaita comments, the apparitions are not rejected. It does not say that they have a natural explanation, nor that they are of diabolical origin. It says that there is no proof. You can approve, reject, or not intervene not make a definitive statement. It's not proven. We do not have proof that it is real, nor do we have proof that it's false. A certain yes, a certain no, not proven. So it's left open to the opinion of the faithful. It is a case to be studied in the light of further information if other elements of analysis are found. This is interesting, isn't it? The current Bishop of Santander wrote a letter to a lawyer in Madrid saying, Santander, February 12th, 2019. I do not have sufficient data to reopen a case that was closed at the time with the communication of Cardinal Ratzinger. It seems that they're not reading the same it seems as if 
Sí, cuando la carta de Ratzinger, ¿verdad? Cuando When Ratzinger's letter importa, says that there's no proof of the apparition's supernatural character, no está diciendo mm, que las apariciones He's not saying that the apparitions aquí. are a closed case, as he mentions here. Pues se ha dado quizá con una Whoever interpreted the letter in this manner probably did so intentionally. The most interesting part of this is when he says, I do not have sufficient data to reopen the case, as if it were closed. It isn't, as we know thanks to Ratzinger's letter. Mariologists say this, it is not my opinion. Manfred Hauck, in his Introduction to Mariology, says that the opinions the hierarchy may have, in our case, the Bishop of Santander, are three, in favor of, against, or open to ulterior information. Listen to what the Bishop of Santander says. In any case, you can consult the aforementioned congregation in case they have information suggesting a different procedure. He advises to look for more information. On other occasions he has said so. Bishop Sanchez is a very respectful man. He says, I'm not going to prevent people from praying or from drawing near to her. It's helping a lot of people. Y que tomarlo en serio, Taking it seriously is a duty and a responsibility. In 2018, as mentioned in his letter to the Congregation for the Faith, Cardinal Ladaria, the current prefect, was told by a Spanish layperson. Thank you for your offer to study the apparitions. I summarize this. Here goes the quote. I assure you that your proposal will be taken into account in case the higher levels decide to enter into the merit of the matter. It's a very diplomatic letter, like the one Bishop Sanchez Monge wrote, saying that a simplicity, openness, closeness, because it's a case, as they themselves affirm, in which the supernatural character is not clearly proven. As Bishop Sanchez Monge says, we do not have stable information. Why? Because the First Commission didn't study the matter in depth. What Bishop Puchol did regarding the visionary statements is not enough either. The second investigating commission, Ratzinger said, we've carefully examined the documentation. For now, we're not going to intervene. If you like, you can publish a note saying that there is no proof. In other words, he leaves it open. This is what he said, what Cardinal Ratzinger suggested the bishop of the diocese to do. So, you can see that we really are missing information. The question is, is there information? Can we find it? Are there witnesses? Thanks be to God, there is a lot to learn about. I would like to comment at this point a testimony someone sent me not long ago, which I am very thankful for, about Ramon Maria Andreu, brother of another Jesuit who was also known as the fifth visionary of Gervendal. Ramon Andreu went up to the village of the apparitions for the first time on July 29th, 1961 less than a month after the first apparition of the Virgin Mary, very early on. I would like to just comment some points. He wrote a summary in a notebook of what he saw and his thoughts. His brother, who was with him, if we have time, we'll come back to him, directed a lot of the investigating that was done in the village during the apparitions. His brother had studied in Rome, Innsbruck, and in Oña, in a Jesuit's house in Castile and León, where he was a theology professor at the time for the Society of Jesus. Father Ramon, who writes that 37-page notebook, 
Ha viajado por todo el mundo. Had traveled the world, led spiritual exercises for a lot of people, including some very great, pure, good souls. And he says, I've never seen anything so big or interesting. I've never done anything as extraordinary as what I saw in Garibanda, learning about the apparitions there. So, how did Ramon Maria Andreo discover Garibanda? Well, we're going to comment his words and take a close look at the events. The rumor that the Virgin Mary was appearing reached me when I was in Aguilar de Campo. The reports were confused, so I did not think much of it until I received a petition from the pastor to join him in his nervousness and loneliness. The tone of those who brought me his message and who had seen what they were talking about, made me decide to see what was going on. I called my brother Luis, the theology professor, another priest, some friends, and we went out of curiosity. We found the pastor in Cosío, and this was his greeting. Do you know the latest news? I didn't know anything. Little news mixed with false reports that passed by word of mouth. Father Valentin's nervousness was obvious. He took me by the arm and moved me away from the group and said, Conchita had a vision in Santander, what we talked about earlier. Her first day in Santander, she had a vision in front of a church. The Virgin Mary told the girls here about it. And the Spanish military police in Santander called their headquarters here to tell them about it. They were very impressed by the fact that the Virgin Mary said that the other girl, they didn't know what was happening in Santander. The girl said, Conchita saw her there. Ecstasies took place there, but just for a day, because you already know what happened after that. And he asked me, what do you think this means? I could not believe anything. I had to inform myself well. We went up to the mountain with these sentiments. Mr. Fontibre, who had been there before, went as a pilgrim. The rest of us went to see something interesting, but with a large number of precautions. Let's see what we're going to find. We had orders to not ask strange questions and see the events. Even though this was so early on, some priests had already done some shocking things. A priest from Leon posed as a member of the commission without actually being so, because he was there from another diocese and had not received such a task, and forced the girls to tell him everything, including the secret. The secret is the first message made public on October 18th. Loli tried to tell it to him. She started talking in monosyllables to sweat and turned red. And after trying for a while, she said, you see, I can't say it. The Virgin Mary doesn't want me to. Because of cases like these, they decided to not ask strange questions and observe the events. So we gathered information, Lodi's parents, Jacinta's uncle and aunt, Father Valentin, and other people in the village gave us. They asked everyone they could. They did a serious and interesting job. The four girls are so simple that you cannot tell a difference between them and other children their age. This normality and simplicity makes them very lovely and almost ignorant of the role they play. Their way of acting in front of the crowds is full of simplicity, trust, ingenuousness, and an amazing surety of everything the Virgin Mary tells them. We're going to jump ahead a little because it's interesting to see on the spot what the people there saw. It makes you almost touch the freshness of the apparitions, right? What was happening when the Virgin Mary appeared? Taking a leap, it says that after an ecstasy, 
The girls did not feel any pain after people pinched them or did other things to them. The ecstasies were so big, they were what in theology would be called raptures, which are different from what the cure of ours or St. Philip Neri had. The altar server would pull on their cassock when mass lasted a long time because they were lost in ecstasy with their soul outside of their body. Sometimes this happened for two hours. St. Philip Neri's altar boy used to go play soccer, come back and pull on the cassock, and then St. Philip would finish celebrating mass. People pinched the girls at Garabandal and tried to hit them in the face. There were powerful camera flashes that shone directly in their eyes but they didn't blink or react, and no part of their body hurt at the end of the apparition. This is what made an increasing number of people come, and what made the people who took the apparition seriously take note of what they saw. Title of an epigraph, the pastor. The impression all the events that took place in his parish had on him was great. He was nervous, the day we arrived, July 29th. He rested a bit when he informed the bishop's curia, as well as when he gathered with other priests he could talk to, to get it off his chest. He's the one who provided information from the start, like the girls themselves and their family members. Ramon Maria Andreu says that the pastor rested when he spoke with those at the bishopric. The document from 73 that I read earlier said one of the bishoprics' big errors was not changing the pastor. Quote, page 3 from the report. The investigating commission, this is after a part that's cut off, did not find support in the diocesan curia at the time, especially when it was asked by the same commission that the parish priest of San Sebastián, Father Valentín Marí Chalar, be removed and replaced by another priest much more suitable for those matters. Valentín did not have the intellectual capacity to make a synthesis of the facts, nor did he ever know how to inform the bishop, while his situation was counterproductive in supporting the facts of the apparitions. So, Father Valentín was a simple man. Father Ramón says of Father Valentín, I'll read this so that we can get to know him from another point of view. He's the one who has provided us with some of the information about the beginnings of the apparitions, like the girls themselves and their family members. We have established other information ourselves through eyewitnesses. He doesn't seem incapable to them but rather open to the truth of the apparitions. He's also very nervous and very overtaken by the situation. In his memories, Ramon Serrano talks about Father Valentin. He talks about him as someone who impresses him a lot. He says, Father Valentin is a proverbial man, straightforward, noble, but not without a certain authority, and a great Bolo Palma bowler. He taught me, a clumsy amateur, techniques to play Bolo Palma. So, he is a simple man. He is very simple. Father Valentin, since he lived in Cusillo and could not be present at everything that took place because the things in Garabandal happened at any hour of the day or night, he insisted on asking us the favor to take the four girls apart after the ecstasies and take their statements and present a summary of their declarations to the Apostolic Administrator of Santander, the diocesan authority in that moment, the year 61. It was Bishop Fernández, if I'm not mistaken. Eustachio and I, Eustachio had hired this young man from Santander, who was an educated man and school teacher in the summer. Eustachio and I promised to do it. From then on, my work in the place multiplied because, apart from the science classes to the usual youngsters in the village school, I would have to dedicate some time to take notes of what was happening. 
The next day, many people crowded around. I sat down next to them, ready to observe them, the girls. When the ecstasy was over, I did not hesitate to take all four of them with me. In the middle of the crowd, I took them to Eustachio's house to take their statements. We verified that none of them had traces of abuse. I wrote the report, and the next morning we visited the bishop and gave him the report, and we exchanged impressions. This man brought the report on several occasions, as Father Valentin had told him. So Father Valentin did not wash his hands of informing the bishop at all. He put someone in charge, one of the most cultured persons he could find in the village, and later came engineers. His choice wasn't bad. And he put, it doesn't say it, doesn't say it here in Ramon Serrano's biography. If I'm mistaken, forgive me. But the truth is, very little of that remains. And where are those reports? Why don't we know what they say? Why have we not had a close look at them to become more familiar with the apparitions? We need more information. The three official studies that have been done, the first commission, the bishop and the main doctor say that it's incomplete and open the second commission. It reaches Rome and we're told, we're not going to answer for now. The statements made before the bishop, the spontaneous retraction we commented earlier, I mean, it's a tremendous case. Ramon continues, forgive me, we're coming to a very interesting part here. What Ramon does in his report is, in conversation with the girls, during his first trip, Luis, Ramon Maria Andreo's brother, the one who saw the miracle in Garabandal and died the same day, the last thing he said was, today is the happiest day of my life. In conversation with three of the girls that were in the village, the other one was in Santander, my brother asked the girls, have you always seen the Virgin Mary from the very first apparition? They answered. We saw the Virgin Mary after a few days. The angel was the first one we saw. Exactly, between June 18th and July 2nd. The Virgin Mary is usually accompanied by the angel. Sometimes, very often, the Virgin Mary appears with the child Jesus. Imagine that. In Garbandal, the Virgin Mary appears frequently with the child Jesus. She's mother. Sometimes she appears with more angels. It's always the same Virgin Mary, but with titles that are not always the same. So my brother asked, Is the Virgin Mary you see always the same one? So they ask questions that were tricky sometimes. Ramon says, The girls speak alternately, sometimes at the same time. They do not do so hastily, but with great assurance. They seem to make no effort to remember, from time to time, so as not to give the impression of interrogating them, we tell a simple joke and the girls laugh. He writes in the present tense, this was written in the freshness of the moment. When asked if it is the same virgin they see, they say, the first virgin was the virgin of perpetual help, the other the virgin of Mount Carmel, with a scapula in her hand like this and she showed how she wore it. And she wore a thing like this and made a motion as if she had something tied around her waist that hung almost to her feet. The scapular is in the child Jesus' hand. When asked if the child says the same things as Our Lady, they answer, the child does not speak, he laughs. Our Lady kisses us and we kiss her. We did not ask the questions too closely, but interchanged them with allusions to the village and other things, formulated in such a way that the answer generally required a correction. We had information from the parish priest and relatives of the girls, and we had spoken separately with some of them, so they were also questioned separately. We wanted to be certain of their unanimity in describing what they saw and thus be convinced that they saw the same thing. And Father Luis asked them, I heard that at some time you have seen several angels. The answer was, The Queen of Angels also appeared to us, commenting on this new title, 
Of course, it is not a new virgin, it's a new title. I did not comment on this before. The Virgin presents herself to us, bringing us closer to different mysteries of the revelation of her Son. Commenting on this new title, under which she appeared to them, we insist. Were there many angels? They answer us. There were five angels with St. Michael. The meaning seemed to be that the number five was including St. Michael on one occasion. And how do you know that she was the Queen of Angels? She told us that she was the Queen of Angels. The secret published on October 18th. The angel had a sign at his feet even before the Virgin Mary appeared. It was very important. On June 24th, the first two words and the number 18 in Roman numerals and the year 1961, but it didn't say the month. The girls did not understand very much of it. They saw a bunch of X's, V's, and I's. Nearly from the first days, they talked about the secret, Ramon writes, the secret we know about. But first, the girls had to live it so that the apparitions were coherent. They had to know how to explain it. In fact, people heard them ask things like, what does make sacrifices mean? What does penance mean? What's the difference? And the Virgin Mary explained everything to them. The Virgin Mary gave the message to them the first day. Jacinta said it was on July 4th, but on July 2nd, she had told it to them. But it was so hard to understand since they were girls with such a low formation that they did not even register it as being the secret. I believe Conchita says so years later, but they remember clearly that on July 4th, the Virgin Mary told them the message solemnly. We must make many sacrifices, do much penance, and visit the Blessed Sacrament frequently. But first, we must lead good lives. If we do not, a chastisement will befall us. The cup is already filling up, and if we do not change, a very great chastisement will come upon us. It is a very brief and simple message, yet tremendously important when everything has to be now to enjoy yourself. That love takes place in sacrifice is a crucial message for families, for married couples, for youth formation. How are you going to pursue a career if you don't make sacrifices? How are you going to have a family or have a serious relationship? It's impossible if you do what the world does. Well, I'm not going to bore you. Since we're coming to the end, Coming to an end, so I'm going to finish now. I'll tell you a story to end. As a conclusion of the 37 pages that Ramon writes, there's a note at the bottom of the page in Conchita's diary. He has an interview from when they asked him on occasions. And he says that for him, this is tremendously impressive. He bears witness that they answered astonishingly. And meanwhile, he wants to be a child of the Church and does not want to precede the judgment of the Church. While it's an open case, the faithful have the right to ask the Church to study the case and guide us. We want to be faithful children of the Church, which is why, knowing that Marian apparition shines, are acting as the world's spiritual lungs. I was going to say Europe's spiritual lungs, but they're for the whole world. The conversions and confessions that take place at Marian Shrines must be taken seriously. We must thank God for them and take things as God wants them, which means committing ourselves to what we know the Lord asks of us. All these very simple, yet very great things 
tell us that our day-to-day -day faith, our Blessed Mother, and the Lord are present helping us. We must take this seriously. I don't have much more to say. There are questions. We can try to answer them. Thank you. How can we effectively accomplish the establishment of a third commission? Do we need signatures? Well, we need prayers. First of all, the most important work to be done in the world is always our prayers and dedication. We need commitment. You can ask the Virgin Mary for graces. What happened in Medjugorje that drew everyone's attention so much and made the shrine approved for visits by pilgrims? even if the apparitions themselves are not approved. Its status is similar to Garabandal's, but a little more open, because the shrine has that reality. When you go to Garabandal, it's very beautiful to see that you are where she walked, where the Virgin Mary was. Yet, the village is nearly untouched. There are paved roads, bathrooms, and places you can stay now. But in the years of the apparitions, there was no asphalt, bathrooms, or anything. So, seeing pilgrims there is moving. The church has four criteria to approve an apparition. One of them is the fruit it bears in souls. If this bears fruit in you and me, and you and I are holy, if when we draw close to Our Lady, you can see that we have vocations, conversions, and holiness, that people risk their necks for Jesus in the Eucharist, they bring Jesus to souls and are apostles, and start formation groups in their parishes or at home, and start adoration, and do things to help people get closer to the Lord and our Blessed Mother, and talk to them about our Blessed Mother's message, because it's open and no one is against you talking about it, then great. Because the fruits are so important, the Church must do a pastoral investigation. Thanks be to God, it exists. I heard a priest cry, in fact, more than one, saying, I owe my vocation to Our Lady of Garabandal. I don't know them very well. I've just seen them a couple of times. And if you kick around, you find more. That work must be done. That is another part. The second thing the Church wants is the doctrinal balance, to see that it agrees with the faith. When you promote Garabandal, it must be according to the Church's faith. You cannot work things to your own advantage. You cannot just do whatever you want. You must respect the Church's faith. In fact, I have not found anything that goes against Church doctrine in these apparitions. In fact, this is what the bishops who have mentioned Garabandal have always said. On four separate occasions, four different bishops said the entire message associated with the apparitions is correct. Delval even says, important. He said that in an interview in 1966, when he had already retired, if I'm not mistaken. So a historical study, an assessment of the facts is important. I think it's something that we have to see in our lives. We are Our Lady's pilgrims. They've passed me a few more questions here. What is my opinion on... Do you think that the Synod... And it ends with suspension points, dot, dot, dot. Well, it's the same. We're going to conclude here before going on and on. The bell just rang. The fact is, when we see the Church go through hard times, we must think of something very simple. The Blessed Virgin, my mother, told me before it happened. She said that hard times would come. She loves me. She is there and she knows. She did not explain every little detail, but she said, a time will come 
In Garibandel, the end of times, hard times are coming. Does this mean that the church is going to be left without a pope? No, because the church can't not have a pope. We pray a lot for Pope Francis. We are there for him and we pray that the whole church may have that courage to give until it hurts, like Mother Teresa said. You and I have to do that, and thank God for allowing us to do our bit, which is nothing, but it's what we can do. And if we don't do it, it doesn't get done. If you do that little bit, the Lord does the rest. So let us go when the good moments come. We can pray a Hail Mary now. Thank you all very much. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the benefits received from your generous and providential hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Santa Maria, Madre Holy Mary, Dios, Mother of God, Dios, and our Mother, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. On the channel, Servants HM Films, a new film is coming out on December 8th, in English, The Life of an Impressive Priest, I Am Fire, The Life of Father Henry. Watch the trailer, it's worth it. It conveys Garibandal's message indirectly in his soul. In fact, you recognize the landscape in some of the shots. God bless. Bye.